Uh, so my name is Jack Menino. Uh, I'm also from the U.S. Uh, I'm out here for a week and a half, something like that. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, cloud native security patterns. Um, just out of curiosity, who works with cloud native systems, containerized things on a regular basis in here? Okay, cool. Um, generally, when people throw around like the cloud native buzzword. They're talking about microservices running inside of containers on some kind of distributed orchestration and management system, which more from these days that ends up being Kubernetes as the engine. Um, there's things like Mesos out there. Um, Amazon, for example, has ECS as their container engine. Um, but more often than not, you're, you're talking about Kubernetes these days. Um, most cloud platforms have a Kubernetes engine. GCP does, Azure, AWS, um, Oracle, uh, and IBM, obviously, they own OpenShift now, right? So if you look at all the big people playing in the cloud, they're all using Kubernetes for that stuff. So um, I have more of a background with AWS, so I'll probably talk more about AWS and Kubernetes um, than anything else um, with regards to Kubernetes. Um, there's the opportunity to get rid of a lot of security debt uh, when you move to a cloud-native kind of implementation for your microservices. Um, but a lot of times we find that we kind of take a lot of that debt with us. Um, so the system works and it ships versus we have to do security stuff. It ships, right? The business wins. That's arguably how it should be. So we end up backlogging things like secrets management and like encrypted traffic and logging. Um, we just kind of nip some of these things in the butt up front. So today we're going to look at just some of the different patterns that we can use um, for things like authentication, authorization, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's me. Uh, that's me teaching my daughter Matterns on the left. Um, she's going to need a job soon. Um, I don't put sugar in my coffee, but everyone in Europe is like, do you want sugar in your coffee? I'm like, I have respect for myself, so I don't do that. <laughs> um, and I don't drink Budweiser, so any Budweiser fans in here? Good. Because <laughs> I can tell you, even in America, we don't drink that shit. Um, we have respect for ourselves. People we talk to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So run Invisium, uh, which means I'm either a manager, I do technical stuff. Um, I still sneak a lot of tech stuff in. Um, predominantly code in Scala and Go these days. A um, little bit of TypeScript and Angular, but uh, very, very much a back-end service guy. Not so great on the UI side. So let's talk a little bit about cloud native systems. So at a really high level, we're generally working with things running in containers. Uh, most people think of containers, they think of Docker, right? There's other flavors of containers out there. Um, arguably that do a lot better job at security and isolation than Docker do. Um, but more often than not, people are like, who runs a container tech besides Docker in here? Curiosity? Rocket. Rocket. Okay. So one of the rocket. Okay. Rocket. Okay. Gotcha. Um, more often than not, it's, it's Docker these days. I mean, there's a lot of people running rockets. It's Docker. Everybody uses Docker, right? Um, generally when we're building microservices, we're building more decoupled services. Uh, and there's some level of opinionation as to what uh, developers are on the hook for in terms of the stack, right? So there's some beliefs that you just give developers base images and they build code. There's some belief that our developers are going to kind of define that whole stack, right? Things like networking, secrets, uh, accounts, so on and so forth. Um, I'm of the belief, I guess, in terms of what I've seen, that I like to abstract developers from a lot of that stack and let them worry about what they really need to, which is writing code um, and not managing infrastructure, right? Um, we work in dynamically managed orchestration systems, so uh, running Docker at scale with like a shell script is not going to work. Um, so we use these heavy-duty systems that make use of clustered resources. So Kubernetes um, can take advantage of multiple computers and it can distribute and manage resource across a cluster. Um, with regards to being declarative, so um, once upon a time we had to like scan a network and uh, I could just talk over that, I'll scream, I'm Italian. <laughs> and um, now we have a really pretty way to just look at uh, a bunch of files, right? So we're building YAML files, we're using JSON, um, but it's all really nicely defined, which means we can actually look at security as opposed to asking 50 different people what the application or system does, right? And uh, telemetry and health reporting are really important, so um, things move a lot faster. So if you're working with, say, you know, legacy type of monolithic systems, um, how often do you reboot those, right? Once in a while, where they crash, um, there's schedule outages and things like that. Uh, in a container world, we generally build them uh, immutable, uh, and they're a lot more volatile to where we're, we're more likely to kill a container as opposed to like modify or patch it live, right? So we have to deal with things like state if you're building stateful applications, but if things are predominantly stateless, then that's, that's a really good strategy, right? Uh, and resiliency. So um, resiliency is really important. And we want to think about 
Um, if our application, you know, drops, uh, is it self-healing? Um, do we have things like circuit breaking in place? Um, so resiliency is something we really think about because we want our services to be really resilient. In terms of security, uh, container isolation is one of the most important things to think about. Um, so what I see is a mix of people doing things that are um, multi-tenant and then single tenant. So sometimes you'll see people building out a Kubernetes cluster and maybe they'll use like a couple namespaces um, for a set of microservices. And a lot of organizations you see where they'll provide, say, um, a Kubernetes or OpenShift infrastructure, and then there's multi-tenancy, right? So now, instead of having a virtual machine per application, we're running all these applications on a single cluster, right? Um, and things like, for example, authorization, relationships, uh, network isolation, all those things just kind of go out the window. Um, additionally, we want to keep you in the container, right? Uh, we don't want you to be able to get out of that container Things like egress rules are important. What can you do on the host system, right? So if you're root inside of a container in Docker, do you have a lot of capabilities on that system or a little? You, you can do a lot of root-like things, right? So um, we want to keep you really low privilege to what you can do once you get outside of that container. The control plane is something you have to deal with. So if you're running Kubernetes or something like that in a cloud platform, uh, they give you like a managed control plane. So if you use an AWS, you use like an EKS service, they manage a control plane for you. You still have to spin some things up on nodes and compute instances, um, but they at least manage the control plane, which is huge because they also build a lot of security opinionations into that. Um, and it's just one less thing you have to deal with, right? Worrying about patching that. You still have to worry about versioning, but they, they do a fair amount of stuff there. Um, control planes, you know, the key to the kingdom, right? If you pop the control plane, that's where all the cluster state is stored, you know, so if you want to take down services, uh, steal secrets so you can get to stuff. All the whole nine, you do it through the control plane. Segmentation is one of those really religious things where people either really want to do like hardcore segmentation or they're like, whatever. And um, there's, you know, some ways you can do that with like network rules. And there's also things like Envoy. And um, has anybody heard of Envoy, Istio, or any of those tools? Um, you can do a lot to do like routing rules and stuff like that and use basically PKI infrastructure. So you use a combination of certificates and routing um, to kind of reduce the blast radius, what services can do. Um, so it's it's fairly important, but there's also other things you could do besides network segmentation um, at a logical boundary, which also gives you some of those separations you'd think about. Um, and the other things we'll kind of run through, how auth authentication, authorization work, um, the different security boundaries, we have to think about those things. Secrets management, like I said, is that thing people just dump until the end. They shouldn't. Um, we'll look at why. And logging and monitoring is one of those things where you really want to think about where you have visibility. Uh, you want to be able to see things at the cluster level. So if somebody tries to attack, say, your management APIs, you want to see that stuff. Um, if you're running on a platform like AWS, well, then there's also service level stuff you'd get about the cluster. So you want to potentially know what's happening at the cloud platform level. And then you also want to get information out of the containers themselves, right? So, you know, traditional application logging. Um, and as we'll look at, there's some other facilities as well. Um, that you can use to detect anomalies. So using things like seccom violations and app armor violations, uh, you can get a pretty good view of what's happening and you can see uh, malicious behavior pretty fast. So whose job is it anyway? <laughs> Who knows? Um, everybody has their opinion on this and a lot of times it, it, it's one, built on the culture, two, um, just size of team, right? So in some groups where there's like, say, you know, a handful of developers and they manage some infrastructure, right? You're not going to have really cleanly isolated views of what people do. Whereas some of the bigger orgs I've been able to work with over the years, um, they have like dedicated platform teams. They have the DevOps people doing certain things, um, IT services, and then developers doing like some things, right? Um, I'm of the opinion that you want to keep developers away from things they don't really have any business knowing. So, I'd rather teach, you know, Java developers how to develop secure Java, and I don't want to teach them about how SE and Linux works, right? I don't want to teach them about how things like K-probes work and BPF filters, right? That's stick to garbage collection at that point. But um, but everybody has different opinions. Uh, the important thing, though, is give them enough protection to not shoot themselves in the foot, but the ability to still move fast. With regards to containerized workloads, um, so this is kind of sort of what the Kubernetes cluster looks like. Um, so we have an API server, uh, which is pretty much like how you do most management, um, spinning up new containers, killing things, pulling down secrets, 
um, attaching to volumes and stuff like that. You do most things through the API. So if you can get to the API with some level of privilege, you can do some really bad things. Uh, etcd is what's used as a key value store. Um, so etcd is kind of sort of secure, um, but you can <laughs> make it fairly secure using you know certificates for authentication and using mutual TLS for stuff. Um, but things like encryption, right? So at the end of the day, it's like base64 and you can just uh, dump that out. You can encrypt things like secrets um, and you actually have to turn that on. Um, so by default, everything's in plain text. So if you were to get into that, you can just dump secrets in plain text, right? It's a good day for a pen tester or an attacker. We have a controller manager. So most things are implemented as controllers. So you have like a secrets management controller, an RBAC controller, like deployment controller. Um, so everything has like a controller-based abstraction on the back end. This is where our containers actually run. So this is the master, and you can have uh, one or more masters. And you can have zero or more nodes. So you can run containers, and um, you can pin that to the master. Uh, it's a really bad idea because a lot of the security model breaks down at that point, and some of that kind of isolation between the master and what the node does, meaning that if you compromise an application in the container that's running on the master, you're going to have a good day. Uh, so generally, you want to run on different nodes. Um, so the nodes kind of stretch that uh, logical boundary. So uh, something called namespaces that provides some separation. So you get some basic networking protections, um, isolated scope for sharing out things like secrets. Um, but this is essentially where our containers run. So in a perfect world, like this is where you stay, right? Like you don't touch these things on a regular basis. Um, so obviously we wanna keep you from attacking other applications and other containers. So we can solve those with some of the things I talked about. Uh, mutual TLS, um, routing rules, setting egress rules, what the container can actually do. So um, by default, Dockerized things don't have any egress rules. So if somebody attacks that container, they can just start moving laterally between applications, right? If they can actually send network sockets. So we want to keep them away from attacking other applications. Um, we also want to keep them away from attacking like some of the management services on each node. So in addition to the master and the control plane, uh, we also have um, the kubelet that runs. And really, you can think of the kubelet as like a really pretty wrap around the Docker runtime. Uh, that just basically listens to what the schedule and the control manager say, and it says, yes, I have a pod to deploy or something to change, and it's it's kind of really a dumb loop, basically, in how it works. Um, but that's basically what happened. It spins up new containers, it manages it. So if you can attack that, well, you can attack other applications at that point, right? Because maybe other applications are being controlled by that. So that's a nice way to be able to basically pivot into other applications of attack stuff. Um, if you can attack it at the management level, you completely own that application and all of its data, right? And you also want to keep the containers from basically doing things at the uh, cluster level. So each container gets mounted with um, a service account token, um, which is just a JWT, uh, not time limited or anything like that. Um, but, it, you know, it's cryptographically fine. Um, but if you have to be careful as well, um, because that is essentially what it's going to use to access cluster level things. So if you overprivilege that, or if you share service accounts between applications, um, you're exposing them. So for example, if I want to imagine this, right? So um, you have really tight filtering coming in here, right? Maybe you either you don't allow the web ports or like you have it really tight. And I can't even talk to this container, but I can talk to the API server. And imagine I'm using the same service account. I can actually send commands through the API, which will basically get sent to the container. And there's absolutely nothing you can do um, unless you just, you know, just totally wipe out our back and kind of break basic cluster stuff. So... Um, things to think about in terms of container isolation. The control plane and core components um, are really the keys to the kingdom there. Um, as I said, though, if you're on a cloud platform, which if you can run like an AWS EKS or something like that, um, I totally like running on managed platforms because it's less to work with. Um, but basically, here's similar look at things. Uh, a privilege attack, though, um, can have some serious consequences. One of the nice things about Kubernetes um, is kind of how things kind of fix themselves automatically. So if you change um, a pod specification and you want to patch, for example, like uh, somebody says, hey, this container needs to not run as root, right? Um, you can actually change that pod specification and it's automatically going to kill off and restart a new container for you, right? Um, generally, the way it works, it's always trying to reconcile towards the desired state of a cluster, uh, which includes things like security, right? So if you make a change, um, it's going to propagate that like lightning fast, right? Maybe kill off services.
Um, and the good thing about that is we can fix things really fast, right? Um, as opposed to waiting, you know, weeks and months. And we can use different deployment strategies, blue green, AB type stuff, um, to be able to keep up time as well. But it's an incredibly fast way, um, to patch things, right? Um, cause it's just basically constantly looking for updates. And when those happen, it goes live, right? Um, powerful stuff in terms of reducing the mean time to fix application volumes and infrastructure volumes. So, spoiler, um, containers actually really suck at being security sandboxes and boundaries. So generally, there's a lot of shared host and kernel mode stuff. Um, so if you're running as root, uh, you have the ability to get to a lot of the namespaced objects on that host system. Um, things like network uh, sockets, IPC. So you really want to limit what that user can do inside of that container. A lot of the stuff in a um, bunch of the container engines are generally rule-based execution. So you use things like SE Linux, AppArmor, SecComp to kind of layer security on top um, as opposed to some of those things being built in. Or if you look at some of the newer container technologies that are kind of popping up, uh, has anybody seen GVisor, uh, Google Projects? Um, they've done some interesting things where they've actually built a user land kernel and they pass like some syscalls, but then they have implemented like a subset of the syscall surface. So anything you do inside of there is user land um, and it's fully isolated in, in a hypervisor, as opposed to what Docker does, which is controlled through uh, Linux namespace and control groups. Um, so there's a lot of basically, if you look at most of the vulnerabilities that have popped up in the runtimes, they've been um, from faulty implementations, uh, fully namespacing objects, giving you that isolation. So with the right user privileges, you're able to grab things from those objects at the host level and potentially attack other applications as well. So. In terms of isolation, Docker's subpar in that regard. And so here's a couple examples. Um, one in particular was a run C vulnerability. Um, so it was an issue where basically you can provide like arbitrary user IDs, including root, and then you can like assume root privs. Um, so just totally bizarre mode. But more of the things that have happened there have been implementation issues um, with just various security boundaries. And this is the gateway drug for anyone that's never seen like a Docker file. So here's a Docker file. Um, at the top, this is the language, this is the container we're extending from, Golang. Uh, here's me at the maintainer. User root, don't do that. Um, environment variable with a password in there. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Yes. Bad idea, right? It's Captain Obvious. Um, and then we install a few packages, and then finally we actually run our code, right? So we have a full Linux stack at that point, including the Go runtime and all the dependencies we need to run our application. Uh, this is what the engine kind of looks like. So um, system D uh, is essentially what's running um, container D and run C, uh, and that's just basically the big daemon that runs um, on the host. Uh, so with regards to container isolation, um, hypervisor and user space kernels are stronger. Um, and that seems to be kind of where containers are going. Um, has anybody looked at Firecracker, uh, Amazon's container technology? So uh, they open source that at, at reInvent this year. And so they actually use Firecracker under the hood to run Lambda. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different. Huh? And Fargate. And Fargate as well. So they run all that on top of that. Um, but they've taken like more of a hypervisor-based, like clean isolation model. Uh, and my bet is that's going to win over time. Uh, and here's an example. Um, this is about a version behind for each of those, but just kind of gives you a real quick view. Um, essentially, of LXC, Docker, and Rocket, for the Rocket people in here. Uh, and come to find out, Docker is probably the best in terms of strong profiles for things. So they have a really good AppArmor profile. They have a good SecCom profile. Um, so if you have support in your kernel for these things, it um, does a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of the point there is that uh, pick your container technology wisely. Um, based on what you really need from a security perspective. So if you have less tolerance for someone escaping from a container, then maybe you want to run a container within a hypervisor or something like that, right? Where you have isolation between each of them. Now, the thing you lose is, is some of the scalability there because you're obviously building out um, a little bit more to do that hypervisor as opposed to just a, a small container. And uh, while they have really good defaults, guess what people do when stuff doesn't work, right? And of course, like, you know, dumping ground to humanity is Stack Overflow. And when you go there, you find stuff like this, like unconfined. It's like I'm running Kubernetes and I want to just turn that off because like stuff doesn't work. And so if things don't work, what do software developers do? Like 
they work around it because they have to get their jobs done, right? So um, this is a good example, and I've seen this done, I mean, a fair amount of times. Uh, if the defaults are there, more often than not, uh, they won't break your application. So if you're using like the, the default App Armor profile for Docker, probably doesn't break most applications. You might have a special snowflake that needs um, some super privs, but more often than not, your application is not that special. And um, what we get is uh, control groups. So essentially, uh, isolate what you can do. Uh, and namespaces actually allow you to see different objects um, and let you see data, things persist, and so on and so forth. Not all objects are namespaced, so things like time. Um, so if you have the ability to call that syscall, then you could potentially um, manipulate the system time at that point because there's not full namespacing of those objects. So uh, what am I even shipping at this point, right? So this is where it kind of gets fun because now we have application vulnerabilities and the usual stuff we have to do in testing. And now we have the whole container stack. Uh, and we have to think about our containers, you know, on the developer side. And then we have to think about like runtime and implementation, right? So we want to know and we want to maybe have some semblance of uh, provable security, right? Where we want you to do these things and when you basically launch a new application, we have like supreme confidence that's doing exactly these things. Um, so we have things like uh, using a, a controller pattern, which we'll look at to do things like emission control. Um, and we could also do different things around attestation and making sure that we're pushing trusted images to production. Uh, so an example of that, um, Docker has things like, has anybody heard of Docker Notary? Um, GCP has uh, something called binary authorization and basically just allows you at the cluster level to check things at emission to make sure that they you know, pass a sniff test. So was this signed by a trusted key that verifies that um, this container has no known high vulnerabilities, right? Like it has no known CVEs, right? It doesn't have an outdated JVM or something like that. Um, so, but those are things that you can actually have like, you know, full verification um, and attestation of those things using some of the things. So if you're using GCP, there's a really great implementation there. Um, if you're using Docker, there's a really good implementation there as well. If you're using like Swarm. So base images are one of those things to really think about. Um, and there's different opinions there, right? I'm of the belief of start with the absolute smallest image you can. So start with um, like Alpine or something that doesn't have a lot of dependencies and add the things you need. So every single binary and, and application that you have in that container is essentially a way for an attacker to potentially pivot, right? It's another dependency that you have to manage. So um, just basically start with small images, right? Um, less utilities, the better. One thing is you shouldn't pull from latest um, and you should pin to a version. Can anyone tell me why? So if you're pulling down containers, right, and you want to pull down um, Java something, should you pull down a version or should you pull down latest? <laughs> yes, exactly. So what she said was that um, you want to pin to a version because you have absolutely no control over latest, right? That's like basically pulling from pushing master, right? Versus tags or, um, but anyways, uh, definitely want to use version tags where you can do that. Uh, also check the images that you're using. So I talked about things a little bit and we'll look at another example of how they work. Um, but it, they're all kind of moot if you don't have uh, a, a container that actually supports these things. So if you are going to pull in uh, trusted images and things you want people to use, do a sanity check to make sure these things are actually implementing your kernel. Um, and you can just like copy and paste these to do that simple check. Uh, first one will tell you if setcomps enabled. The second one will tell you if app armor is enabled at all in any profiles, um, even a basic one. Do always a sanity check, even if you pull an image you're familiar with. Yes, absolutely. Uh, things can change. Even in images you're totally comfortable with, then somebody changes something and then you don't have the protections you need. So. Um, with regards to things like builds, uh, integrity and attestation, so uh, we want to make sure that we're only pushing trusted builds and things should actually be there in production. So um, I really like the GCP implementation. If anybody just after this kind of follows up, check out how they're doing binary authorization. So they have their own container registry. Um, it's pretty much all like fully integrated to the GCP stack, um, but it's integrated with their registry. Uh, Kubernetes engine, and uh, it's pretty pretty neat first class setup. Seccomp, I keep talking about here, um, and Seccomp allows you to filter um, dangerous system calls. Um, so here's an example of a really simple uh, Seccomp policy. 
Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're explicitly whitelisting various syscalls that we want to allow, and then everything else is essentially denied by default at that point. Um, so the Docker, the Docker defaults are fairly good. Um, you can prune them down even further in a lot of cases, but um, out of the gate, they do get rid of a lot of the dangerous syscalls and things. Um, most applications, especially in like, you know, a high level kind of framework, have absolutely no business call on some of those low level things. Um, so if you want like security quick wins, which like, I like to dig into the hard thing, but I like to just say, here's the easy things we can just get rid of out of the gate, right? Now let's worry about real problems. And in my opinion, this is a solved problem. This isn't something most people need to deal with. They just have to do the due diligence to make sure it works that way. Um, AppArmor does a little bit more. Um, so AppArmor lets you filter things like capabilities, um, also things around uh, network and file access. Uh, and the summary there is that AppArmor also has a first class implementation in Docker. Um, LXC also has a decent implementation. Um, looking at um, Firecracker does okay with like seccom stuff. I haven't looked as much into their app armor policies at this point. Um, but app armor is another one of those things. Turn on the defaults. Um, more often than not, you don't need things like raw sockets. You don't need a lot of things that um, app armor is going to disable for you. So in terms of security quick wins, try to turn on seccom. Try to turn on app armor. Uh, with regards to capabilities, so once upon a time, Root was like this all-powerful thing, um, and we basically reined in what Root can do um, to a bunch of capabilities, right? Um, extremely powerful types of capabilities. So by default, um, Docker gives you these. Um, it takes away things like, for example, um, Capsis Admin, um, things like Ptrace, um, things super-duper privileged calls that you can use to elevate who you are. Um, by default, Docker also prunes that down for you. Um, you can add back all caps. So you can literally do like capabilities, add all, and then you're back to square one. Um, you can also turn off all capabilities. Now, in some cases you can break things, um, but there's also applications that aren't gonna use many of these, right? Um, and binding a network service. Um, this is a lot of time people will run, for example, root. Uh, and they'll run a container from like Apache. They say, well, I have to run on port 80 and I have to run as a privileged user because it's not an ephemeral port, right? It's below 1024. So I have to be root. Well, no, you need the capability to do net bind service. Um, you don't need any other dangers that come with root at that point, right? So um, reducing capabilities was a good step that they took in Linux land. Um, and in the container world, um, you can take advantage of the base capabilities out of the gate that have stripped a lot of the dangerous stuff. Um, the OCI specification, so all the containers now are pretty much building around the OCI spec. Um, the OCI spec actually starts with like these three. Um, audit, write, kill, net bind service. And then um, even other stuff, set GUID, set UID, set PCAP, um, net raw. Net raw is what you use if you want to be able to think, do things like ping. Um, and those are stripped. So. And like I said, more often than not, your containers does not need root. Um, you also want to limit things like uh, access to IPC, uh, network storage, and here's an example if we want to run ping, we can actually drop um, a bunch of capabilities and we can add, um, and yeah, we basically don't have all the things we could do as root and we can just run ping. User namespaces are uh, something that's kind of gaining a little bit of traction there. Um, so modern kernels support this, um, Docker has support, uh, Kubernetes just kind of introduced support for this, um, but basically um, we want you to be essentially a non-privileged user on that machine, right? So if you're able to get out of that container, you don't have really any privs on that machine. Um, so it's a user namespace, then we put you in just basically your own little kind of jail, right? Um, and it remaps the user ID to like a high, they generally reserve a set of ports. Um, uh, I'm sorry, a set of UIDs uh, for that, so it'll just plug you into that UID range. Um, but that UID range has very low privileges on that box, um, which is which is a good way to do it. Rootless containers are becoming another thing. Um, so to do rootless, to do truly rootless containers, um, involves starting at kind of the build phase as well as um, everything else, the installation and starting up. Um, this has been one that's challenging. So if you look at like all the different uh, pull requests and open issues, it's they're just full of profanity and curse words because it doesn't work. Um, but uh, Run C, which is again we talked about, um, container engine uh, does support things like rootless. But really the key is thinking about like the upstream ecosystem that's actually going to run those things. 
um, different flavors on Linux and stuff like that, uh, <laughs> different virtual orchestration systems. Um, fairly challenging to implement something like that at scale. So, um, But rootless is a nice way to go because you're starting and ending with not ever having the ability to become root, right? Um, which obviously affects the way you build and, and install things as well. Um, so if you look at under the hood, how they kind of work, they do kind of an like iterative kind of snapshot method, um, but they're really careful to keep the privileges reduced throughout the way. Uh, cool. So how do I actually use that? Um, so in Kubernetes 1.12, um, through Prosbount, uh, what they've introduced as a security context attribute, um, if you set that uh, to be unmasked, then you can take advantage of some of these things. Um, but I would not run this stuff in production. So if you go back to uh, this slide, um, for example, you see a lot of stuff in Kubernetes that's like alpha, beta, experimental host user namespace defaulting gate, right? Sounds like I want to put that in production. Like, don't put that in production. Um, give it a few versions, but these are definitely technologies you'd want to think about um, to implement really hard multi-tenancy. No new privileges, another good one. Um, so it'll break things like set UID and set group ID. Um, is everyone familiar with like attackers, how they use set group ID? So you want to look for binaries that have elevated privileges. So you may not be able to be root, but you can attack a process that can elevate itself to root and you can basically privilege escalate from that. Um, so in Docker, you can set that with uh, the, um, I'm sorry, uh, no new privileges. Uh, in Kubernetes, it's basically a security context constraint, allow privilege escalation. And if you set that, then it will limit your ability to do that. Um, going back a few slides, if you also here drop the capabilities for set group ID and set user ID, then you've also neutered that ability as well. So you have a couple different ways you can attack those same things. So authentication is tricky because we have to think about authenticating to the cluster. Um, we have to authenticate users. We have to authenticate applications, right? Um, we're going to have users, you know, DevOps people, infrastructure people that are going to have to do different things at the cluster level. We're going to have different monitoring tools that we're going to have to privilege and then our applications and then the control plane itself. Um, additionally, we can also use webhooks for things. So we can send data um, over webhooks. Uh, we also want to authenticate endpoints as well, right? Um, so a lot of different surfaces to think about. By default, Kubernetes uses like a self-signed certificate infrastructure, um, which is probably okay for a lot of people, but a lot of groups I know will generally, you know, want to put their own certificates um, in place for that, right? Um, but that's one, the comment out of the gate, people are like, hey, oh, it's all self-signed, right? So uh, if that doesn't work for you, then no that uh, once you spin up a cluster, you need to also use your own certificates at that point, or it's self-signed. <clears throat> Implementation flaw here, it's really common, is um, account reuse. Uh, so by default, um, in Kubernetes, uh, each namespace gets a default account. So if you don't explicitly set a user account, it uses default, right? And then you launch another service with default, then you launch another one. So remember how I was talking about before that if you were to use that across apps, you could just basically send like API uh, commands and pop that, right? Um, so that's a very good reason to not do that. Additionally, you also share things like secrets, right? So we can manage, you know, account passwords, um, private keys, and secrets. And um, if we have one account, then that basically means that, you know, each of those... So we've broken things like separation of concerns and stuff like that, right? Because um, an untrusted application or someone that doesn't have access can pull your keys. An attacker could just basically dump your database at that point. Um, and here's an example, uh, just kind of what that command looks like there. It's literally just like um, whatever your endpoint name is, and then you can just basically add your commands as a set of um, multiple commands there with floods. Um, but the key there is that even if like network access is blocked, you can still basically do things with the API. So how do we fix that problem? Really easy, actually. Um, create a service account per application, basically, per, per um, pod. So in Kubernetes land, I should add that um, a pod can be a collection of containers. So you can run more than one container in a pod, but you'll generally run a pod with a single set of um, credentials. Uh, and this is something that it's it's kind of a no-brainer. It's a quick win there. Um, basically, create an account, um, and then inside of your pod uh, specification, specify the account you want to use. And at that point, you've completely broken that attack vector. Um, but obviously, you don't want to overprivilege those accounts either. 
Um, but this is one that's really, really important. Um, something I totally recommend. It's low hanging fruit, but that's one of those things that you have to kind of implement in process. Now you can do other dirty things like um, implement pod security policies that disallow people from using some of those user accounts. You can script some of that out. Um, so you can do other kind of enforcement methods to disallow that. Um, but something you should totally look for and encourage as a behavior. Don't share anything from the hosts. Um, you want to keep the attacker at B inside of the container. Um, you want to limit the volumes that they can attach to, the things they can mount and access. Um, host namespaces for different things. The host network, um, IPC pipe, so you can also share like IPC, um, Docker daemon stuff. The rule of thumb is uh, share as little as possible. So you can probably not see that too well from the back, so I'm going to try to blow that up here. Um, but this is what a pod uh, security policy looks like in Kubernetes. So this is something we can set centrally, and we can define the things that we'll tolerate and we'll tolerate when you're trying to deploy a new container to the cluster. So here, for example, we're saying host network false, host IPC false, host process ID false, and um, basically we're just disallowing um, you from using those uh, system resources. So this is a policy that we can have actually evaluate against everything being emitted. Um, so we can just kind of eradicate those vulnerabilities in a central place. I don't think this is a good thing to play whack-a-mole with, like each application, like fix, 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 just set these policies and it's like set it and forget it. Authorization is the next piece. So now that we've authenticated you, whether it's as a user or as a service to the cluster, we have to figure out what you can actually do. So um, turns out you shouldn't be able to do everything. And um, generally we want to limit you to be able to access, you know, for starters, objects you own that are part of the applications you own um, and not things outside of other namespaces and so on and so forth. Um, so Kubernetes started off with um, attribute-based access control, um, and pretty much nobody uses that because it's kind of a deprecated. And everything is uh, role-based access control using RBAC. And um, there's two different ways to look at role-based access control, um, cluster level and then namespace level. So if you give someone a cluster level uh, set of rights, they have access to all the different namespaces. So if you give someone like you know, cluster admin, then, you know, you're on your own. So generally, you want to start off by giving your developers or people that are accessing like a set of namespaces roles and role bindings, right? You don't want to give them cluster level things. So start at the namespace level and if you really need it, um, and sometimes you'll see like um, monitoring tools and different tools like that are going to need some broad capabilities, but you want to isolate them on their own as well. Uh, the way RBAC works is that it's cumulative, so you can't take away permissions, but you can add them, right? Um, and here's an example of what these things actually look like. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we're going to create a role. Uh, this role here uh, has access to the production namespace um, and the rules. First, it has access to the core API group. So um, the geniuses that created it said, hey... Um, we're going to leave it blank, but that means core, right? But it's, it's literally like an empty string. Um, so first off, you have to give people access to an API group. So in Kubernetes, there's different API groups for a lot of different things. Um, from managing pods to doing things like managing certificates, uh, different deployments, role-based access control. Um, and generally, you're going to have like API groups where they've kind of split these things out. Um, networking, logging, so on and so forth. Um, so, again, they're cumulative. You can add permissions, but you can't take them away. So if you don't give them RBAC, then there's nothing, right? So we have access to the core group, which has a lot of the typical things like secrets, pods, and, and most of the things that you consider primitives are inside of the core API group. And then inside of API groups, so as I mentioned, we have things like secrets and we have all these other objects. We're only given access to pods. And then, in addition, we're saying you can only do get watch and list. So you have the typical restful things like create, read, type methods, typical CRUD things. So you have a get, you have a post, you have a put, you have a patch, right? Um, you have all the standard methods you're gonna use. Um, and so basically this here is saying that these are gonna be read-only types of things. So a get is exactly what you think of. Um, watch, so in Kubernetes, and it kind of points back to etcd, but you can actually um, do things like set what they call like informers um, and watches. So you can watch what happens to an object. 
So you can set like a watch and then you can subscribe to updates based on what's happening for like adding, modifying, like deleting things. Um, so here we're saying you can't actually like kill stuff. You can only read stuff, right? So that's what you can do. And that doesn't actually do anything until you actually bind it. So that's one thing that I've seen people try to implement our back. Like, why doesn't this work? Because you didn't bind it to anything. Um, so it becomes real when it's bound. So in this scenario, we're putting in the production namespace though. Now we're actually tying it to um, a subject, right? Which in this scenario, the subject is a service account, not a user. And then, um, yeah, basically it's a role and um, now it's tied to a real user. So now that user, um, when they authenticate, whether it's through service account token, um, that's all they're gonna be able to do, right? So uh, sometimes people will give really, really broad access beyond that. Um, start small is my opinion. So as we mentioned a little bit about the controllers, um, controllers are pretty much the abstraction for a lot of different things there. Um, so we have like a pod controller, we have a secrets controller, a mission controller is the one we'll talk about a bit here. Um, but essentially the controller has the ability to modify and, and, and mutate state um, in between trying to emit and being deployed into the cluster. Um, so we can take advantage of that. So there's a lot of different security plugins and tools out there. Um, people have implemented. And uh, emission controller is one of the real popular ones in Kubernetes. Um, so pod security policy is one of the emission controllers that we can use. So we set this at the API server. Um, and then this is basically a cluster-wide thing. Um, and essentially here we have the ability to uh, look at stuff, right? So when we go back, going back here um, to the pod security policy, uh, when we try to... I didn't do it. I think they're trying to tell me to go home. Okay. Um, so basically, we, this is a pod security policy, and this is implemented through emission control. So um, we can make this as, as, as granular and strict as we want, um, but you can also break things really badly. So if you drop, um, excuse me, as I did here, all capabilities, and you do that you know, cluster-wide, I promise you, you're going to break something. Like, absolutely, you're going to break something. Even if it's monitoring types of stuff, you'll break something, right? So tread lightly as a security person that has a hammer when you do things like this, because this is the quickest way to lose all credibility with everybody on the planet, which is break everything, right? So um, these are powerful things, but you definitely have to think about them before you just press the button. And um, to be able to set that, um, you just basically set that as a, a pod security um, an emission control flag, um, not generally enabled by default. Um, things like RBAC um, from like authorization are generally on. Uh, so the important thing there is uh, there's different deployment tools with different opinionations. Um, does anybody use Cube Spray in here? Has anybody heard of that one deployment tool? Um, it's a real piece of shit, quite frankly. Um, every security mistake you can make is in that. And we have clients that have used it in the real world and Unfortunately, they took every one of those security mistakes and they're like, hey, this deployment tool does everything for us. And um, give me an example. So um, I don't know if they changed it. They might have fixed this. This is a couple months. This is three months ago. Um, if you use the Cube Spray tool, um, it deployed your etcd cluster um, bound to all interfaces, which means like anybody can access it and without um, authentication. It's cool. So basically anybody on that network can literally connect to etcd and, and do anything they want to the cluster, right? It's like just straight game over out of the box, right? Um, if you're using something like Cube Admin, which is, you know, uh, the preferred deployment tool, um, they have built some good security opinionations into it. Um, and some of the low hanging fruit that was there in earlier versions, um, they've done a better job at. So if you're using Cube Admin, I don't think it's perfect, um, but it's maybe better than some of the other deployment tools if you just want a clean reference implementation to start from. Um, so as I mentioned, security pod security policies, um, they're really powerful, uh, but they could also be really complex. So there's some weird rules that kind of um, screw people up when they have multiple pod security policies. Um, but one of them is around like the alphabet, uh, alphabetization of things. Um, and that seems to be the rule that people kind of get um, stuck on. So first what happens is that um, if there's any policies that can get the container admitted to the cluster without making any changes, that's what... Kubernetes prefers, so it tries to go with the path of least resistance. 
Um, if there's multiple policies that kind of conform to that, it just says eeny, meeny, miny alphabet. And then it basically does an alphabetization. So um, you do want to kind of think about those things um, as you're designing um, because you can – I've actually seen people end up attaching like the wrong policies to things like um, – this thing manages NFS. Um, we have some special stuff, and but everything like you. So I've seen people really screw that up. So um, really think about the policies, the overlap, the different kinds of systems you're going to put out there. Um, because essentially you end up tying it back to role-based access control, um, which if you tie that back to things like groups, then you can um, design policies that you know conform to things. Maybe have the databases group, the um, Postgres group, right? The JVM group or something like that, right? And you can push policies depending on the technologies in use, but you actually have to label and think that way. And um, building and designing a, secure, uh, a pod security policy um, is, is definitely, you know, admittedly that's one of those maturity things too. Like I don't think um, most shops have the maturity or knowledge to just get in there and, and dig really deep. Um, so my opinion is that if you were going to start out with pod security policies, um, the SecComp and AppArmor profiles are like a really quick win. Uh, more often than not, they don't break things. If you configure them beyond that, you break things a lot of the time. Uh, things like privileged, you don't need to usually turn that on. Um, I wouldn't drop all capabilities. That's a little extreme in some cases. However, volumes, I, I do like to limit the amount of volumes and things you can attach to, right? Um, host network, host IPC, host PID, you almost always never need those things. So... Um, and by almost never means like if you start out with like these are things you can never do, then you never need those things. And if you start out with like, well, we we'll kind of fix that later, then you need those things, right? So if you start, I think that is a good place to kind of take a hard line and be like, we will never allow these things and you never use root containers in production, right? And start from smaller. Um, and some of the stuff here, like read only root file system, that's cool. Um, and you could use it in a lot of cases. So. If you don't want the ability to like change the root file system, uh, or you don't need the ability to change system files, set that. So if anybody basically changes system files and you get like an alert, that's like an immediate sign of an anomaly because that's a read-only root file system, and under no circumstances does your application actually behave like that, right? So as long as you have those clearly defined behaviors and things you know, you can turn stuff like that on and you solve a lot of problems out of the gate. To actually apply these policies, though, um, you need to give it a role-based access control. So I've seen people like, yes, we put pod security policies in place, but we still have containers running as root, and why isn't this working? And the answer is um, they probably haven't attached like role-based access control policy to it. Once you add RBAC, then those pods, as they're being deployed, can actually pull those policies down. If you don't give it RBAC, then it, it doesn't have access at the API level to actually pull those policies down. So it just doesn't do anything. Sidecars are awesome. Um, has anybody heard of Envoy or Istio or anything like that in here? Uh, Envoy is really cool. So Envoy is kind of what's being used behind everybody's magic. Um, service meshes are like the hotness these days, right? Um, AWS has App Mesh they just launched. Um, Azure has Service uh, Fabric Mesh. Um, Google is really hardcore into Istio. Uh, they're all built on top of Envoy, um, which is a Lyft uh, technology. So anybody probably heard of Lyft, right? They compete with Uber. Um, they open sourced Envoy, which is um, an L2, L3 proxy uh, for applications. Amazing technology. Um, we can use sidecars to things. So uh, we can actually lift a lot of security controls out of the container in the app and put it in a sidecar. Um, so things like uh, configuration, uh, things like uh, logging, um, TLS um, as a proxy, we can actually forget about some security controls and just put it into a sidecar, right? Um, and this is great in some ways. Um, we can decouple things. Um, we can kind of separate. Uh, we can have um, security opinionations and we kind of try to scale them and push the same thing for standardization. Um, but you have to have ability to inject that sidecar every time you launch a new container. Um, so generally you'll want you know something like um, a framework or a technology that's going to essentially handle that. So Istio is one um, which you can use it to essentially inject the sidecars automatically. Um, when you spin up new containers. Um, if you don't have that sidecar, then you don't have any of that security boundary, right? Ambassador pattern is similar. Um, generally, you can use um, an ambassador pattern, uh, excuse me, I lost my, um, as a proxy, right? So a little bit different, but you're generally, 
Um, using something like an ambassador in front of legacy services to um, just kind of keep them around a little bit longer, right? So um, you'll use it a little bit different where it's not like here is, um, you could actually have an ambassador that maybe um, proxies multiple applications. Um, but a key boundary there is figuring out um, how you want to share those between apps. Um, one interface, I mean one single point of attack for better or worse. Um, the service mesh pattern is really where all this stuff comes together. Um, so I'm going to blow that up uh, just because I think it's a good picture here. Uh, and it kind of illustrates the point and how this works. So here is our sidecar, um, which in this case, this is Envoy, uh, which is essentially going to be running an additional container um, in front of that other container. Um, and then basically network rules and stuff like that are, are, are going to go through this, right? So this is going to proxy traffic in. And then this is also going to basically do egress stuff as well. Um, so we get mutual TLS between services, right? So who can honestly say in here that every one of their like APIs and microservices on the back end is like fully TLS, like end to end? Meh. I mean, most groups have like some thing they've poked a hole in, right? They haven't wrapped in TLS. Um, so this is kind of nice because it's an L2, L3, you know, basically working on like byte streams. Um, it's kind of protocol agnostic. So they have, um, some of the major protocols they've implemented proxies for. I know they have like Redis support. Um, I know like Postgres and some of the real common things and technologies. Um, but everything else, it's just essentially, it can think on like L2, L3 and it's just pushing bytes. So it doesn't have to be protocol aware. So it can also help you kind of blow up some of those things. Um, everything is basically uh, certificate and secret based, right? So, um, we can do things really fast, like revoke certificates. Um, so if we have a compromised service, um, we just basically revoke the certificates that it uses and it can literally can't communicate with any of the services, right? Um, really nice technology. Uh, not as easy. Um, there's definitely um, things like Istio and Envoy. There's definitely um, a barrier to entry as well as like cost of maintenance. And um, they, for example, Envoy, is it... 43 or 44 custom resources um, that it implements. So it implements a lot of its own um, just objects and stuff like that. So it, it totally adds complexity in some cases, um, but it could also solve a lot of problems. Um, and basically it allows you to do automated injection um, with some of these. So again, getting that sidecar deployed automatically with the application takes some work. Um, things like Envoy, Istio solve that for you. So if you've never played with these things, Definitely take a look because it's a good way to lift some security controls out of the container and, and let you focus on just a different set of problems, right? Because you have classes of problems solved. Envoy, Istio, um, and Console, uh, which is a HashiCorp thing, um, are just some of the most popular implementations that you see people using. Secrets management is the last thing I'll dwell on tonight because everybody screws this up and I understand why, unfortunately. Uh, don't do it this way for starters. So um, we look before it using environment variables in Docker. Uh, that's actually the worst way to do it. Um, for starters, there's probably be a lot of different logs, interfaces, dashboards, um, where that command is going to get dumped. It might be in like shell history, right? So your bash history maybe another place where you find that. Um, additionally, any process inside of that container uh, has a better likelihood of being able to dump out those variables, right? Um, not the same protection. Uh, Docker does have a first class secrets management API. So if you were to do something like that, but again, right, command. Um, Kubernetes has a secrets management API as well. Um, you can either pump that in through um, text files, you can pump in commands, you can use YAML for that. This is a better way to do it um, because instead of storing it in plain text somewhere, um, but then people do that with like shell scripts, right? They'll put credentials in them. Um, but this is a better way to do um, secrets management. So it'll mount the container with a secret. Uh, that's going to have a little bit more um, local file system kind of restrictions and everything like that on users process that can kind of access those things. Um, definitely the recommended approach. Um, but of course, nothing is perfect in this world. Uh, plain text storage by default in the cluster, right? So if you pop that etcd uh, key value store, then you get like all the application secrets, right? So your developers should be using application secrets, right? So here's where you sound like the security idiot, right? You're like, use secrets, but it's like insecure because you just, they're in plain text anyway, right? Um, this is a thing, right? So you've at least limited the scope to etcd, um, single point of failure, but still some issues. I don't know if anyone sleeps well at night knowing that those are in plain text. Um, 
prior to 1.7, there wasn't the ability to do any encryption. Post 1.7, you can do encryption of the secrets, but you'll use um, an AES key for it, right? And you'll put it in a YAML file, and then you do like cube control, create, um, or rather you, you put it in a, a location. But the moral story is now you have to store a symmetric encryption key on the file system of the data that you're symmetrically encrypting. Um, who can tell me why that's a bad idea, right? So again, it's not perfect, and this is probably the best you can do if you're using in-cluster storage for your secrets. This is, this is the best you can do. Uh, there's other approaches. Um, so if you're using like a managed platform, like um, AWS and uh, Kubernetes, uh, it's not actually fully integrated with like uh, their secrets uh, management solution. So you kind of find out it's a little sticky there as well. Does anyone use Vault by any chance in their environment? Um, Vault's really cool. Um, there's an open source version of Vault and then HashiCorp also has like an enterprise version. Um, Vault's a really good tool. So you can essentially take a lot of the secrets. So you can't get rid of cluster secrets at that point, but you can get rid of application secrets. Um, and you can move some of those to a vault. So basically what happens there, um, and I'll skip to the next slide there. Uh, essentially what you do is you have, um, in Kubernetes, you have uh, what's called like an init container. So before your primary container spins up, you have an initial one that does initialization. And you can use that to do like early life cycle stuff, bootstrap certain things. And one thing in particular you can do is call out to um, APIs. So it mounts that secret, like we said, right? So each container gets an application or a secret, uh, and then you can use that to authenticate to other things. So that's a JWT. So if you're not using different service accounts, so you're starting to see how these early things we punted on, right? Now, imagine we had uh, every application in the namespace was using service account, and then we were trying to unlock a, a secrets vault using that same token between 10 applications, right? So we've moved our secrets and we've implemented it wrong, right? So the technologies are out there to do this stuff right, but more often than not, it's, it's just implementation and design bugs, right? Uh, so this is a nice way to do it. Um, you're using the token that's mounted, right? So that's already there. It's, uh, it's trusted, it's safe. There's a reliable way to put that into the container. And then you're doing an API call with that as your secret to the API of Vault. And then that essentially allows your service to pull down the secrets that it needs to get from the cryptographically secure vault. Does that make sense? So your application doesn't actually have some of the secrets when it starts, but it gets kind of bootstrapped with that stuff afterwards. Um, but if you do some kind of strategy like that, then you can move a lot of your secrets out of the cluster and um, maybe a little bit less to worry about, but still things to worry about, right? You end up just moving the problem somewhere else a lot of the time. If you have the ability to use um, like the platform kind of features as they get better, I would imagine my guess is that each of the major cloud providers are going to get better at just providing like first class implementation with their key management services or different secrets managers. So like Azure, for example, AWS, like they have key management services. They have um, various utilities that just, at least on the AWS side, it's not first class implemented yet. So. That's my presentation, everybody. So uh, hopefully what you got out of that is think about security early in these things. And that's everyone in here, we, we say that, right? But um, I found that in the cloud native world, people want to move really fast, but they want to move securely. Um, the more of those things you can just kind of do early on to keep them on track and, and shape the right behaviors out of the gate, um, the better. Because these architectures, just they get bigger, they get bigger. We deprecate service, we add new ones, and um, I've seen shops that uh, they've launched things like this, and it's taken a really long time to rein stuff back in. So if you're launching a new infrastructure, just try to start out with as little debt as possible. Uh, focus on how your organization works, um, things like access control patterns, who needs access to different applications. Um, you want your developers and engineers to move fast, but you want them to do it safely. Uh, but you don't want to slow them down or make their apps not work, because then they're just going to work around you forever. And uh, last but not least, apply security controls to the layers they actually belong at. Some things make sense to do in a Docker file. Some things make sense to do at the container orchestration level. And then at the end of the day, we still have good old secure development and good design of our applications as well, right? Um, so depending on where those security controls need to be, focus on that, right? At the infrastructure level, the cluster level, container level, and the application level. You really do have a choice of where you put the controls. That's my presentation. Uh, happy to take questions. Thank you.
Suck that bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Chef, for the presentation. Thank you. So, we'll send you the slides, so if you guys want to take them off. You will me. send me the slides. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah.